Um, can I just say thank you to everybody for such a lovely warm welcome and I've had some great conversations already this morning with members of the faculty and, and I've enjoyed that very much. So this is an interesting opportunity to talk to a lovely audience with a variety of backgrounds, experiences and knowledge of sensory science. Uh, it makes it quite challenging. So I've decided to tackle this by having a foundation and backbone around sensory in there because some of you may know very little and I want you to be able to leave this room knowing something more than you did when you entered. Uh, there's also uh, a plan to try and bring in some experience of what it's like to do all this in the real world because that's, that's the fun stuff and maybe some interesting stories along the way. But also I wanted to add an element of what's the most current trends as well because I didn't want to just deliver stuff that you could read in a textbook. Uh, there's a lot of new things happening in the sensory science arena and it's important that we, we touch on a few of those today. So hopefully the plan is something for everybody. Uh, we've got 50 to 60 minutes, so I'm going to be reasonably rapid and I will be here after if anybody has any questions. And please tell me, stop me if anything doesn't make sense, okay? So, we all know sensory science is a scientific discipline. It's all about presenting stimuli and using our senses to, uh, you know, to, to see, to smell, to touch, to taste, to evoke some sort of perception that we can then in some way quantify, analyse and interpret and use that data to help us learn about the stimuli that we've used in the first place and you know, in, in our research, research endeavours, whether that's academic or whether that's commercial. It is a scientific discipline and in order to get good, reliable results and robust data that you can trust, there needs to be control. Any scientific rigour that you would apply to any other experimental situation also applies to sensory. It seem, might seem a strange thing for me to say, but over the, over the years I've had a number of people say things to me like, oh, I think I'll go into sensory because I don't really like maths. And, and <laughs> which I always thought was quite amusing. Uh, and of course sensory draws really from psychology, from chemistry, biology, from physics, certainly from statistics in large doses and, and therefore is undoubtedly a science that requires the same consideration a, a, of any other. And in that consideration is you will only get out the value of what you put in. Uh, and that's a, that's a strong message I think that I'd like to start off with. And we need to control all the elements that feed into creating our experimental paradigm. So we need to control the environment in which we do it. I've not ever been somebody who thinks you have to have the most expensive and, sh expensive and shiniest of sensory booths in order to do really good quality sensory work. It's not about how much it costs to create the environment, it's about how you control the environment and understand what the environment can do to your experimental data if you don't think about it. So you can do incredibly good sensory work in a well-lit room, um, in a well-lit room with tables and chairs without very expensive kit. It's lovely to have specific environments, of course, uh, but it's not a deal breaker. You need to control the participants, always always and very difficult to control often, whether they are consumers or trained sensory panellists. We need to control the samples because invariably the samples are the things that we're looking for underlying patterns between. Are these samples eliciting different responses? If we're not in control of those samples, our own interaction with them could in itself create the results that we're gathering. So we take control of all of these experimental elements and uh, Having done that, we hope to have created a, a good designed experiment that enables us to understand specifically what the different treatments have an impact on in terms of the sensory. So there's lots of scientific and journalistic versions, so always interesting are the, the taste panels conducted in the media where two people have sat down and looked at a pie together and shared half of it and come up with a view and we, we have manufacturers of products in all sorts of agony because woman's own has said that this mince pie is the best one this year and that's going to actually drive behavior of consumers because they they will take advice of course 
But this is all the journalistic approach, and this is not sensory science. This is a group of people sitting around together and having a good tasting session and having a lot of fun. Um, so we need to make sure we understand the difference. One of the things that's vital in sensory is that we have a really clear objective. And I loved, used to love the time when I was at Nottingham and, and people would come to me and say, I'd really like to do some sensory. And I'd go, yes. And that would be it. No, I'd really like to do some sensory. Like it was some big black box that you just shoved samples in one side and all the answers of the universe came outside the other. And if you thought about that in a microbiological uh, domain, I'd really like to do some micro. <laughs> you know, you need a little bit more direction. So a good, strong objective is essential. Um, right, so that's my foundation-y stuff uh, in terms of setting the scene, convincing everybody it's a science. Now to really think about how we, th how we compartmentalise the different tools in the box that is sensory science. So typically the first cut is that they, we think about our toolbox as collecting objective data or subjective data. So objective data is all about trained individuals, selected individuals, gathering information that are facts, not judgments, just facts. It might be how intense the chocolate flavour is or whether you can identify a different sample. Objective information is using human beings as a measuring instrument in the same way that you might use a GCMS or a pH meter. We don't really care whether they like it or not. We want them to give us data. On the other side of the fence, we've got all the subjective methodologies, the consumer research, where we want to capture people's feelings, their values, their attitudes, their judgments, their likes and their dislikes. And this is all in the consumer domain. It's all subjective. The two are very powerful individually and even more powerful when used in combination. And most of the exciting work we do is, is about using them in combination, for sure. On its own, consumer work will tell you what people like and dislike and leave you wondering, well, what can I do about that? How do I change that? They say they like the flavour of this, but what do I do to the flavour of that to make it different? On the sensory side, you might learn that the flavour profile of these products are very different, but you don't necessarily know what that will mean to a consumer. So you can see that when you put the two pieces of the jigsaw together, you can get quite a powerful, a powerful answer. So some of the most common reasons why people come to us and, and seek out a piece of research would be uh, probably the, the most common one is benchmarking. How does my product compare to the competitors? That's really, from a retailer's, a manufacturer and a retailer's point of view, that's the real holy grail. They want to be the best, they want to sell the most, and how they manage to do that, of course, is hugely important to them, and so they'll invest a lot of money in finding out how their sits in, in the marketplace. But there are, there are more altruistic reasons that can sit behind that. It may be that actually where they're trying to design a product that's healthier, that confers better well-being, they might be trying to take salt out, fat out, sugar out, and wanting to understand what the consequences of that is. They may want to extend the shelf life of a product so that they can lower the cost of it and make it more affordable. They need to understand what the consequences of that is. Uh, and sometimes it is a cost-saving exercise. You know, they realise that people are more competitive on price and they want to compete and offer a, a lower cost option to consumers and they need to understand how they can change ingredients to do that. So lots of different reasons. Um, invariably, whatever the answer they get, there has to be, and so what do I do with that information to take my product forward? Uh, so there always has to be that thought about the end game, starting with the end in mind when you're designing your sensory experiment along the way. So I've talked about the subjective and the objective cut. And now let's talk about some of the tools in the toolbox. And really, this is the most common division of uh, the different methodologies. So we've got discrimination tests, that bucket. And these are all really designed to ask the, answer the question, can you tell the difference between stuff? And they're all objective. doesn't matter whether you like it or not. Can you tell the difference between it? The next bucket are the descriptive tests. These are also objective. And those methodologies 
go deeper into understanding the product qualities. They're all about identifying attributes that characterise the samples, and those attributes have to be very well defined and very well understood by this panel of people who may have spent many, many weeks training on that product. So we run a lot of descriptive panels. One of those is a spectrum panel. They specialise in potato products like chips, and they spent six months training on that methodology because that is that complex. So that's six months of coming in every week for two sessions a week just to get ready to be able to do it. Uh, other methodologies have less of a burden for training, but none of them it, that give you the detailed profile of a product can be done in five minutes. So if anybody says to you, yeah, no problem, I can give you a descriptive profile, just give me a few hours, and comes back with some data, they're probably not doing, <laughs> doing using one of the standard methodologies. They may be using a different one. Um, yeah, so they're the two objective buckets. And then, of course, the one that can get very exciting is the consumer bucket, where we're really looking at those attitudes, values, likes, dislikes. So this slide gives you some information about who would participate in those. I mean, anybody can participate in a discrimination test, whether they're a trained century panellist or whether somebody you just invited in off the street. They can still answer the question. The idea is that you should always have the same type of somebody. So if you're going with naive people from the street that you're recruiting, have them all being naive. If you're going with trained individuals who may have been screened for their sensory ability, go with all trained. But either group is fine, they can still answer the question. With descriptive methods, there are some, as I mentioned just now, that require a lot of dedication in the training. So really you need highly trained panels to be able to do that. There are other methods with which you can have very naive individuals uh, conducting them and they're much more rapid. So that's why it says anyone. It's not literally anybody can do anything, it's just depends on the method. And then with consumers, it has to be consumers. You can't take a trained panellist and expect them to be a consumer. They don't think of the world in the same way. When we set up our shampoo and conditioner panel um, a few years ago, I spent a lot of time thinking about the protocol for how to shampoo your hair at home to be a, an assessor of, of shampoo and conditioner. <laughs> It would be fair to say that myself and none of us who participated in that setup ever really washes our hair in the same way now. We are no longer just a consumer. And uh, I was on holiday last week and I came across this product and I'm thinking, oh, this is dreadful for ease of spread and coating. I need to take that back as a reference for the panel. Uh, so, you know, you don't, you don't ever however you think, you lose that consumeriness if you've ever walked the walk of a trained panel. And we always say if people come off a trained panel, they're not going anywhere near consumer work for at least three months. So they've lost that analytical spirit. So these are our three buckets, and we're going to talk in a bit more detail about those three buckets, and it's within those that I'm going to give you some fundamental stuff so what it's like in, an, in a commercial organisation and a few of the latest trends, okay? So, getting the right people on the bus is one of the first things. So we've talked about the whole objective, subjective, uh, and irrespective of what method you're applying, you've got to make sure you get the right people on the bus. All of our senses work together, so we may be only interested in flavour, but we need to think about the perception of texture and somebody's ability to see the product because we need to accept that they will have an impact on our perception of flavour, not just their ability to taste whether they can detect sweetness or acidity or bitterness. Uh, so all of the senses need to be checked. So when we're looking at objective methods, if we want to recruit a sensory panel, they need to be able to detect the stimuli they need to be able to discriminate between the stim different intensities of the same stimuli. Sometimes people can say, yeah, it's there, or no, it's not, but they can't do the fine-tuning stuff. And they need to be able to talk. No good if they're a shy, retiring person that's going to say nothing in the, the group work. 
uh, and they need to be able to be articulate about describing the stimuli. So that's the objective side. On the subjective stuff, so consumer work, we need to think about age, gender, socioeconomic class, uh, who are the people are buying the product and are we getting the target consumer into our study. If we're going to run a study on pizza, we don't want to recruit a load of people who don't ever eat pizza. So it's, it's sort of common sense. We want product users and we want users in a demographic profile of what the target user should be. So we do a lot of work where um, our recruitment managers are always like, oh, if it's always young men. So hard to recruit young men to do anything. Uh, so she's always hoping that the age range is going to be 18 to plus 65 because the over 65s are brilliant. They're always there at least 30 minutes before the start of the test. <laughs> it's a day out <laughs> and they're absolutely there. They're never unreliable. We've taught so many people how to use a computer. It's an incredibly rewarding spin-off of the job. Uh, we know we've had all the experiences of people waving the mice like this, trying to get it, and it's been fab to be able to help people learn new life skills, let alone anything else. So she loves a big wide age range, but there's no denying that there are some products that are not made for a wide age range. So when we have, um, as we have this week, 70% uh, of women, 30% of men, between the ages of 25 and 45 who were nutrition seekers. That's a little bit more narrow <laughs> for the yoghurt study that we're running this week. So, you know, we can get all sorts of different peculiarities. We can have recruitment criteria that include people who have a, a, a you know, a, a real zest for life. So we might be using something called a food neophobia scale to make sure that they're up for different products and um, it's about making sure you've got the right bum on the right seat. And as the slide suggests, sometimes it's about attitudes and beliefs as well. Uh, and yeah, it can be quite challenging, but fun. Well, I'm just, I say it's fun. I'm not sure our recruitment manager would agree. So, okay, any questions so far? Okay, dangerous territory. Discrimination methods then. So the thing about discrimination methods is they're all about can you tell the difference. So they're all about presenting a series of samples for which you may think that you've changed something and nobody can tell and you want to test out whether anybody can. We talk about them as difference tests. We talk about them as testing out whether people can tell the difference. But very often what we want is to produce samples that people think are the same. So it's sort of similar, you know, just because people can't tell the difference doesn't mean that they're fundamentally the same, statistically. Uh, but really, if you think about it, if you're making a crisp and you want to take the salt out, what you're testing out is, can people, do people still think it's the same as it was before? So most of our difference testing in life is really similarity testing. Uh, but still, they're called discrimination tests, either way. The fundamental thing about a discrimination test is the two things need to be confusable. If it's a cat and a dog, don't bother. Don't waste your time. Because you can look at them as an individual and go, well, one's a cat and one's a dog. There's no point putting the effort in. But you'd be surprised how many times the cat and the dog do get sent for testing. And to do one, one triangle test with 60 people from a commercial point of view, if it was sent to us, it's about two and a half thousand pounds. So it's not a small investment. If you've managed to, if you've reduced the salt in something and you and every other person you've ever given it to in your immediate circle say, yeah, it's really obvious, don't waste two and a half grand getting somebody else to independently justify that. Only, only go there if it's confusable. And that is, that is a really good thing to remember. Sometimes we get so down in the detail of the science that we forget to ask the common sense question. Okay, so this is some stuff you could probably get from a textbook. So this is just some examples of different types of discrimination tests. There's lots of options in the toolbox. There's tests that ask overall difference, so they don't really specify exactly what it is you're looking at. So here are 
here, if I was going to talk about a triangle test, which I am in a moment, here are three samples, two are the same and one is different, tell me which is the different sample. It doesn't guide you to a particular attribute, it just says generally, tell me which one is different. Now, you can play around with that and say, you can disguise what they look like and put a blindfold on somebody and just tell them to sniff it in an amber jar, then obviously they're only going by smell. Uh, but still, we don't direct them towards a particular smell, just one modality. So that's why they're called the overall difference ones. Uh, they don't really specify an attribute. And there's lots of them. This is the most populated category. <coughs> Triangle, tetrad, duo, trio, two out of five, same difference to name but a few. And you can read about them in many textbooks. If you've got more, they're, they're all about two samples, irrespective of how many you present. It's still only <laughs> fundamentally about two different things. If you've got more than two, you've got things called difference from control. If you want to specify the attribute, say you only want to ask about sweetness, then you can do tests on this side. You can do a paired comparison. Here are two samples, which is the sweetest? And you're directing somebody to a particular attribute. And if you want to have more than two samples, you can say, here are four samples. Put them in order of sweetness, from the most to the least. And then all of a sudden, you're ranking. And each of these methods has a different way of, of being conducted, a different way of posing the question, a different way of gathering the data, and a different way of analysing it. But fundamentally, they all come back to the same thing. Is there a statistically significant difference between the samples at a level that's appropriate for my study, which is usually 5% um, significance level for sensory, as it is for many other scientific endeavours? There are a lot of things to consider, and I'm not going to go through all of these because we'll be here for the whole hour. Uh, I'm just going to focus on a couple, and you can read those at your leisure later. Number of panellists. So, dependent on the method, you have a different number of ideal assessors. The number of assessors, participants, is linked to how statistically powerful it is. So you get more bang for your book in some tests. Uh, they're, they're more difficult to guess the right answer. Rule of thumb, if you can easily guess the right answer, you're going to need more people. If it's not so easy to guess the right answer, you're going to need less. Uh, so whichever one you choose, then that's one variable. OK. So now I'm going to talk a little bit for a few seconds about the triangle test. And the triangle test is probably still the most commonly used discrimination method that there is. I don't know why. It's a bit like a fashion that's really hard to break. I really don't know why, because it's not the simplest, <laughs> for sure. Um, but I think it's because it's got a word that people like. Maybe people like the picture of a triangle. I don't know. So a triangle test uh, involves presenting three samples to your participants and giving them an instruction. And this ballot gives you an example of that. So you will receive three samples. Two are the same. One is different. Please identify the different sample. Usually the samples are blind coded with three digit codes as in all good sensory work. And people identify the, the different sample. They might give you some comments. Fine, that's the standard triangle test. How many people in the room have learned about that before or even participated in one? Excellent, loads of you. So I'm on, on very good territory. So in this particular example, it involved two, two apple, samples of apple juice, 24 people participated, 16 people identified the different sample, and the action standard what, to switching to the new crop of apples was that there would be no significant difference. This is pretty typical of the sort of thing that you might get in industry. Um, you can use all sorts of different ways to analyse the data. There are tables published and you can look up what's the minimum number of people that I need before I say that they're, they're not different or I've got no evidence to suggest that they're different. Or you can plug it into some little software or software packages will spit you out the probability of your result. So you can see 24 people took part, 16 people gave the correct response. There's a one in three chance of guessing the right answer, 
don't worry about this and this. What is the probability of getting that result if they were actually the same? So this is your significance level, and we can see it's a lot lower than 5%, or a lot lower than 0.05. Uh-oh, bit of a problem. There's a significant difference between the samples. Uh, we're not changing the apple supplier today. So the conclusion is there's a significant difference. The action standard hasn't been met. The suppliers will not be switched. OK, makes sense? So that's the basic triangle test, as is often applied. Uh, and there are lots of reasons why triangle tests are good. They require less panellists. Uh, you don't need to specify an attribute. They're relatively simple to do and understand. Uh, and they're great when products are more complex. They do rely on memory. You taste your first one, you've got to remember what that's like by the time you get to the second one, and you've got to remember the first one by the time you get to the third one, and memory effects can be a bit of a problem. So, this is an interesting slide, and if you are conducting triangle tests, this is a really useful thing. So this graph shows a group of individuals' ability to tell the difference between samples comparing the triangle test done when they're not allowed to retaste, so you're only allowed to taste each one once, you're not allowed to go backwards and forwards and taste them a multiple of times, versus how well they were able to tell the difference if they were able to retest. So let's not worry too much about what this axis is, it's just a metric that says this is how well they can tell the difference. The bottom line is whether it's a triangle test, a same difference test, or a dual pair which is similar to the tetrad, um, you can tell the difference more easily if you retaste than if you don't. So, if you're conducting triangle tests and you've never thought about that before, or you've thought about it and thought, well, it doesn't matter, or actually it'd be faster if I don't, or any of those things, bear this little piece of research in mind. It's from 2000, so it's not super new, but, but it is very powerful. Um, the question is, does retasting make the most sense? If you were a consumer, if you're trying to mirror what a consumer might experience, retasting might be sensible because they'd go back and retaste. It, does it make sense to only tell them to do it once? You could massage that in your favour, uh, and people do. Oh, I don't really want there to be a difference. We're not letting them retaste. That happens. Um, I'm not saying it's good, it's not clever, but it definitely happens. Uh, but yeah, useful to share. So, I wanted to show you this because I think this is really interesting. Uh, it's the psychology or the process that sits behind a triangle test. So we're, we're a little bit more at the advanced level. And this is something known as the paradox of the discriminating non-discriminator. So remember, a triangle test involves two samples. So sample A and sample B. So these are the distributions of what we might expect from a sample. Because a sample, if I gave you 10 samples of the same thing, they're not going to be absolutely identical. As they hit our senses, our perceptions aren't going to be absolutely identical every time, and they aren't going to be absolutely identical themselves. They form a distribution. So you can have sample A, and it might, it might give us a stimulus response here. You can have another sample A and it might give us a stimulus response here. Make sense? They're close together, these distributions, because remember, they're not a cat and a dog. If they were a cat and a dog, this one would be over here and this one would be over here. There'd be no overlap. We'd never have a problem. We don't need to do the test. But these are confusable stimuli. It's logical that there's an overlap. It's logical that some of sample B's stimulation is less intense than some of samples A's, where the tails cross. So this could represent our triangle test. The first of sample A, the second of sample A, and the sample B. Now, we know sample B is the odd one out here, don't we? Because we've got two A's and a B. But if you were to actually taste those, or smell them, or see them, which sample do you think you would select as the different sample? Go on, be bold, shout out. A. a. And we, we would. We'd select A because that 
as in terms of a stimulus intensity, is far away from B and C. The difference between B and C is actually tiny. So we've got a discriminator. They're truly discriminating. But they're non-discriminating because they're actually getting it wrong. And that's com that can be what happens. So that's just a little, a little funk. <laughs> you know, you get negative results that are negative, not because people can't tell the difference per se. It's just that the distribution of stimuli from each sample is not a perfect thing. They're not separate. There's a crossover. So you could argue, of course, well, that's exactly what a triangle test is meant to give you. If it's confusable and you get this situation, then, of course, ultimately, we won't tell them as different. Happy days. But just remember that concept, because it will become relevant in the next, the next moment. So we get asked to do discrimination tests about, I don't know, it's about 5 to 10% of the, the total work that we do. The two tests that we've been asked to do most commonly, triangle, <laughs> and the reasons why, it's always, it's always cost saving or salt reduction. Salt reduction mostly, and it's mostly snacks. We're trying to take the salt out, and we want to know that it's not having an impact. And we're not just going to focus on saltiness, because actually we know taking the salt out of stuff changes its texture, and sometimes it changes how it looks as well. So. We're going to keep it general. We're going to use a triangle test. Um, but for us, the company that does most of those, they like to use trained and screened assessors. So they're stacking their deck in favour of being able to tell a difference if it's there. They're not just using consumers. And they're using 60 of them. So they really are pushing it in terms of we really want to know that when this product hits the streets, we're not going to get a load of complaints of people saying, oh, it's not the same, you changed it and you've not told us, because they don't like that. Um, so that's the most common reason for us to do, to do this work. But the world has been taken by a great new craze, and the craze is the tetrad test. And so we have done some of those experimentally on beer, interestingly enough. <laughs> Very popular. Um, and if I've been asked once, I've been asked a dozen times in the last three months, can we go and do training on how to conduct a tetrad test and most importantly, how to analyse the data from a tetrad test? Because mm -hmm. nobody's yet produced a table that says this is how many correct responses you need in order to say that they're different. So um, I want to talk to you now a little bit about the tetrad test. So this is the, the latest trends. And I'm sorry these slides are a bit unpleasant on this, this uh, screen, it's a bit light. So basically, in a tetrad test, you get presented, I'll skip over to there, with four samples, two A's and two B's in some presentation order, of which there are six. Um, it's like lots of different ABBAs. Uh, but there are six presentation orders. Now, immediately, whew, I've got memory effects abounding and fatigue, potentially, because I've got four samples to taste now, not just three. Uh, and there are three possible types of answer, one of which is right. So if you are wanting people to group them into two groups of two, that's a correct response, that's an incorrect response, and that's an incorrect response. So we see there are one in three chance of getting the right answer. So if it's a total guess, you've got a one in three chance of guessing the right answer. So back to our distributions. And now, of course, having shown you what I showed you before, this will make loads of sense. There are two ways that you can ask the tetrad te test question. And this, in my experience, is the one area at the moment that people are not paying the attention to. And this is a great illustration of how the, the devil is really in the detail. So if you ask the question, select the two samples that are most similar, which two samples do you think are going to be selected? The two in the middle, yeah? I can see some of you gesturing at me. Those two. Is that a correct answer? Bearing in mind that these represent, so that's the distribution of sample A, say, and there are two samples from sample A, and that's the distribution of sample B, and there are two samples from sample B. So if we're putting those together, because they're the similar, most similar in terms of how they've impacted on us, we're not getting it right. 
And what's interesting is even without that sample in the mix, we'd have got the same answer. And that's just the same as the paradox of the discriminating non-discriminator we saw in the triangle test. And from my experience, people who've leapt into Tetrad have done this without thinking, thinking they're doing something that's better than triangle, and they're not. They're doing something that's effectively identical to the triangle test, but they've got more fatigue going on, so I've actually consumed four samples for the benefit. So, if you're going to do it, this is the way to do it. You ask people to group the samples into two groups of two. You mustn't just say, tell me which two are the most similar. You have to specifically say two groups of two. And if you do that, that is an unlikely outcome. <laughs> so they might want to do that because they're the two most similar, but a person will not want to do that because that will not sit right in your mind because they're the two <laughs> most different. Yeah? So that's unlikely. That is more likely. Even if it's slightly annoying because you want to put those together, that's the more logical and likely outcome. Because of that, because the test is there anchored on four, some four data points, it's statistically more powerful. And that's why it's really popular. Because one of the problems with all discrimination tests is that you've got to use a reasonably large number of people to get the right answer. Products are launched on the on the results of these tests. If they get it wrong, it's a big whole pile of complaints for the <laughs> consumer complaints department. So they don't get it wrong, they put a lot of investment into it. So any method that comes along and says, oh, you can get the same statistical power but with less people, happy days. And to illustrate that, this delta is a measure of how different two things are, so, or how easy it is for people to tell them as different. So to reach a power of 0.8 with a triangle test, this is the number of people that you would need to be able to see a statistically significant difference at, for two samples that are that different in themselves. So let's just take something at random. So 184 people you'd need for a triangle test if you wanted a power of 0.8, uh, and samples were 1.05 delta units apart. Equivalent for a tetrad, you'd need 47 people. That's a lot less people. So for a triangle test, so for 65, you'd need 22. So you're talking a good third less, and that's why it's really popular, because people are a, a very valuable commodity when it comes to running sensory studies of this sort. Make sense? So there you go, the tetrad test. Okay. I don't know how we're doing for time. I feel like I'm going very fast. OK. Faster. So next bucket, descriptive. So remember, discrimination, can you tell the difference? Descriptive, we're now looking at profiles. We're down in the detail. We do a lot of descriptive work. We've got 300 plus trained descriptive panelists sorted into panels that some just focus on pet food, some focus on chips, some focus on skin cream, some do anything, anything you like. And they all require a lot of training. Six months for spectrum, more like three weeks for the basic principles of a method called quantitative descriptive analysis, which is the most commonly what used one. And then after that, for each new set of products, if you've got four products, say, you'd need, for a well-experienced panel, you'd need three or four training sessions on those products, and then they could move to rating the intensity. Uh, so this is going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tool. So the thing about descriptive methods is, you say, you're really going down into the detail of what are the key characterising attributes of these samples. So we've got dogs. <laughs> you need to think about how many samples you're going to use and what range they span. And does that range make sense? If we had hamsters and cats in here, it probably wouldn't make sense. You wouldn't normally test hamsters and cats with dogs. But lots of different dogs, that makes sense. You can apply that to any food product you like. So here are some sensory attributes of dogs. Um, and what's important is the assessors work to very strict protocols. 
If you were assessing the softness of fur on that dog, you would absolutely need to be stroking that dog in the same way as the person next to you. Now that might be obvious when you can see stroking a dog, but most of the stuff you do is in the mouth. So that's a lot of training and focus on, right, you tell me what's going on with your teeth now, where's your tongue? <laughs> and seriously, if you're really going on a strict protocol for sensory assessment, you need to be down in that detail. How many times are you chewing? When are you swallowing? You know, is, is it a bolus? Is it a slurry? Is it in your teeth? Where are you assessing that? All of these lovely conversations can be yours uh, if you want to go in this area. So, here's three, three different examples. QDA I've mentioned already, Spectrum mentioned before, and there's a whole pile of rapid techniques because this stuff is expensive and takes a lot of time and a lot of sample, and you might not have that. So the rapid methods are really, really popular for getting there faster. Uh, Rachel has had much experience in both QDA and napping. So after I've gone, if you want to know more, that's your woman. Uh, so there's some information in here about what you need to be able to run. But fundamentally, all methods go through, all of the standard methods, not the rapid ones, go through some attribute generation to create the list, strong definitions, strict protocols, rating the intensity of each of those attributes. A normal lexicon of attributes is at least 30 attributes long, not one or two or three or four. The normal food products are 30 plus, sometimes more. Crazy, really. You can tease apart. This is why they're analytical after they've done this work. This is why they're never going back and using shampoo in the same way or looking at a chip in the same way. Uh, you're generating data and then you're using statistics to analyse it. The fundamental difference between Spectrum and QDA is about the scaling. One uses an absolute scale and one uses a relative scale. And I think this is quintessentially the most important thing to wrap your head around in terms of understanding what descriptive analysis can give you. So in Spectrum, a scale for hardness, say, and sweetness, are con and every other thing that you can imagine, are considered to be perceptually identical. Spectrum scale actually goes from 0 to 15, so I should have uh, amended that. So ignore low and high, 0, 15, uh, and has units all the way along, 15 units, and you can subdivide those. So a score of 13 on the hardness scale is exactly the same as a score of 13 on the sweetness scale. So that is as hard as that is sweet. And these scales are absolute scales, which means there is no food product known to man that you can't put on it. So the top of your scale for hardness is like lead, or whatever is the equivalent of lead in food. And the top of your scale for sweetness is, the, is a concentration of sugar that is more sweet than anything that you'd imagine, which is going to be something like honey, or it's, it's that intense. So you can fit anything on. Benefit? You guys can uh, apply this method and test a load of products and you can compare it to somebody testing the same products in Australia. You're using the same scale with the same references. All spectrum scales have multiple references to say, right, a three is a this, a five is a this. That's why it takes six months to train because you just have to eat so much. Um, and all the references are American, so you have to order them well in advance. Um, but you can create UK versions. So it's great, you can test, you can compare results you did 20 years ago to what you did now. Great. Problem, because it measures everything, I want, I'm interested in the subtle difference in saltiness between these two crisps. Well, they're in a really narrow range on that scale, because this is a range of saltiness that's for everything. Um, so I was sceptical when we first started working on it, but seriously, that trained panel can discriminate statistically between two things that have mean values of 0.1 apart. And I would not have believed it before we actually started using it. So they assess the bitterness in chips. It's not, chips aren't that bitter. I see regularly data that's at 1.1 and 1.2, significantly different. 
on a 15-point scale. How can that be? Well, that's just ridiculous, but it's true. And they do it again and again and again. And that is like the most sensitively, highly trained panel you can get. So I used to think that it wouldn't be very discriminating, but it is. On the other side of the world, we don't always have six months. We have QDA. And in QDA, the scale represents the range of samples that you've got in front of you or the range of samples you decide to train on. So if these are our dogs and we're rating furriness, if you start with those dogs, you will not be able to fit those cats on later because those cats are a lot more furry than any of those dogs. And your scale for furriness was set with those dogs in mind. If you want to get the cats on later, you have to keep the cats in at the start. So your scale context is relative to your sample set. Yeah? I'm just filling it with pictures of cats if, <laughs> in case, and good dogs. You might hate the concept of scales, but you might like cats and dogs. Uh, so, so that's a really important factor. And we get a lot of, oh, can we compare this data set with this? Well, no, because they, can put, they use none of the same samples. There were no common samples, and they had totally different contexts. So a three for that test was not the same as a three for that test on that scale. Okay? Your data looks like that and bigger because you've got 30 attributes and 12 panelists and three reps and multiple samples, and that's really hard to look at. So we visualise it and we apply statistics. People like these... I personally hate them. My brain doesn't work round in a circle. I don't know anybody who likes to read round in a circle. But because they're sort of unique to sensory, people like to present them. Um, and they're, sort, they're OK, because you can get a lot of attributes on if you've got two samples. The minute you've got more than two samples, you're in all sorts of purgatory. Is that more or less? Is it swapping over? And if you've got low levels, it's just a big fat blob in the middle. So they're not, I don't think they're the easiest to work with, but they can look really pretty if you put nice colours on. Uh, I prefer a line graph. My brain works in a straight line, personally. That's pretty hard to see, nonetheless. I'd probably chop it here and stretch it out a bit. But nonetheless, you can at a glance see, well, this chap that's green is you know, higher intensity than pretty much all the others for these attributes. And you can see things that are similar and things that are different. When there are loads and loads of attributes and loads of samples, we make big fat maps. And we look at trends and samples that are close together are probably similar. And all of the attributes that are at extremes of these scales, left, right, top and bottom, describe the differences that are pulling those samples apart. And I'm sure you've all seen, seen PCA maps before. OK, latest trend, napping, rapid method. Here are some apples. You arrange them on this sheet of paper in front of you based on what differences you think as an individual there are. You eat all the apples and you put them around on the nap, which is French for tablecloth, hence the name napping. We use flip chart paper nowadays, not tablecloths, but still. So you arrange them in an order that represents their differences and similarities, and you might write on some words that describe them. You convert that to data by creating an XY plot based on that being the origin, and they become your numerical values, and you plug all that into multiple factor analysis, and you get a friendly statistician to help you, or... Uh, and you can do it yourself, you can do it in R. I think that's what you did, right? Uh, and you can get consensus maps of how the samples are fundamentally different and similar to each other. You can do all of that in a day. Actually, you could actually do that in probably three hours if you were pushed. If you compare that to the six months of training for Spectrum, you can see the sort of situation we're looking at. But you've got to use things that you can actually consume in that length of time. Ice cream is a bit of a problem because it sort of doesn't stay the same. Okay, so we do a lot of QDA, a lot of spectrum, not so much napping. People use napping as like a pre-selection. I've got 30 samples and I need to choose eight to go into my consumer study and I don't know which eight to choose and I haven't got time to do complex sensory. Can I use napping? Absolutely. You can 
choose your eight samples from your napping and usually the ones you choose are the ones that are the most different to each other. If you want to know what consumers think about a sample set, why would you choose eight that are all the same? You want to challenge the consumer a bit and give a bit and give them some variety and see, well, does it make any difference if it's more salty, less salty, more hard, less hard? So that's why we might use napping. We might take one from up here and one from down here and one from over here and one from over here. And often when we do napping, we do one nap for each modality. So one for appearance, one for aroma, one for flavour, one for texture. Because you can't think about all those things at the same time and represent it on one piece of paper. And then you can put the words on separately and can you analyse them separately. OK. Nearly there. Consumer studies. Uh, and I know that this is something that many of you are involved in already from the conversations that I've had this morning. And it feels like it's one of the easiest things to, to do because really it's just about gathering people and asking them how much they like or dislike something. But remember, the devil is in the detail of how you ask the question. Sometimes you think you've asked that question, you've asked a completely different question. Questionnaire design is critical for correct consumer study and getting the right bum on the seat. Uh, some information that you can read later about considerations and stuff to think about um, in terms of setup. So, usually, commonly, you've got preference tests. Here are a pair of samples which you prefer. Here are three or four samples, put them in order of preference. You've got acceptance tests or hedonic tests or acceptability tests. They're all called different, the same, different labels, same thing. Usually a nine-point hedonic scale. That's the most commonly used from like extremely to dislike extremely, and I'm sure that's the one that you'll be using. It's used the, the world over. Usually a minimum of 100 participants are recommended. Um, it depends how much you want to cut up your data after. If you want to look at the difference between men and women, you might need 100 men and 100 women. If you want to look at users and non-users, you might want to split it like that. And the more cuts of the data you want to look at, the bigger your sample set gets. So for us, ten, five years ago, 100 was probably, and 150 were the two common quantities of individuals. The last six months, 200 and 300 is now the most common. What people have realised is that they, can, they can't really just make the questionnaire longer and longer and longer and longer. It doesn't make any sense. And it really nullifies the value of the questions that you do ask if you ask too many. But you can get a lot more information if you use a larger sample set with consideration of who is in that sample set. And it doesn't cost twice as much to do a study with 200 people as it does with 100 people. So they're making the studies bigger and drawing more from them. So that's the, the current trend. Other questions that you might ask, you know this, how much do you like or dislike? Oh, this sample was really disliked. Why? <laughs> that why question has got to be the most common. And so usually now, some sort of diagnostic questions are included to try and anticipate that at the end. So if you think that sweetness or crispiness or, or juiciness or, or anything that, that is understood to the consumer, that's an important consideration. Your scientific word is not necessarily a consumer word. So don't pop in there, which, how do you feel about the viscosity of your sauce? You know. <laughs> uh, they don't necessarily understand the difference between texture and, and, and flavour. You'll say, tell me what you like about the flavour. It was grainy. Or actually, that's probably not a good example. You know, it was bitty. <laughs> or something that's obviously a texture. So these things get mixed up. But diagnostic questions help you understand the why. Um, the co most common ones are jar. So how do you feel about the sweetness? Far too sweet, slightly too sweet, just about right, slightly uh, um, not quite sweet enough, not at all sweet enough. So they have to have a mirror. Sometimes the language <laughs> of the mirror questions needs a bit of thought because you wouldn't go slightly too unsweet. Oh, that's not normal words, is it? As a consumer, when you're reading that, you're thinking, what is that? What do you mean? Uh, Sometimes agree-disagree statements with a like at five-point scale. 
This product is too sweet. Strongly agree to strongly disagree. And other popular kata, which of the following terms, so that stands for check all that apply, or tata, if you want tick all that apply, depends whether you want to be American or not, uh, a whole pile of terms, tick all the ones that are relevant for your product. This could be attributes or characteristics that you think it has, ways it makes you feel, ways in which you want to use it, anything. So, again, standard acceptability test. And some examples of jars and, and Likert scales. Your data looks like this, and this is probably the most common output from a consumer test, a bar chart. We don't do line graphs or spider plots in consumers, it's all bar charts and often frequencies. Jar data should never be analysed with a mean because the middle of the scale, a three, is what you're aiming for. So if you've got half of your people thought it was really too sweet and the other half thought it was really not sweet enough, you're going to get a three. <laughs> and that will make you think, oh, yeah, it's perfect. So never, never means on jar data, see it a lot, uh, but better frequency counts of people in each category. And then you can see what your distributions are. So you're looking at distributions for, for jar data. OK, I'm going to flip past the case study. And the latest trend in consumer assessments got to come into three categories. In-context studies get people out of the booth and into an environment that's, that's more natural, but still controlled. Don't let them in their own home. They're not controlled there. They'll eat it, but they won't answer the questionnaire until you hassle them for it, and then whatever they tell you is not real. I'm not that cynical, honestly, but it's true, isn't it? I mean, how many times, with all the best intentions, do we not do what we say we're going to do or think we will do? So in context studies, getting people out of a booth is a hot topic. Emotional states and capturing emotional states, still a hot topic. It's been around a little while now. People telling you how they feel can be quite difficult if they're in a booth. <laughs> uh, so in context and, and emotional tend to sit hand in hand. And the other hot topic is intrinsic or implicit methods as opposed to explicit. So if I say um, to any of you, tell me how much you like this. You're thinking, hmm, how much do I like that? I'll put that answer there. That's a very explicit method. You've actually thought about it, you've cogitated on it, you've given an answer. There is a school of thought that says that none of that is real. All of that is biased by what you think somebody else wants you to say, uh, and it doesn't really relate back to what is fundamental, your gut instinct. So implicit methods are all designed to get at those good instincts that make us make choices that later we post-choice rationalise, but we don't really know the why. And so the implicit methods are trying to get at that because they feel that that is better at understanding consumer behaviour. And I can give you much more detail about those if you're interested. But this was a study that we did. It was affectionately known as the living room study. So people were invited in couples that normally sat in the evening and snacked on nice things whilst they watched the TV. So they could be a married couple or a boyfriend-girlfriend or any sort of couple or a couple of friends or a mother-daughter, whatever it was. They had to come over six weeks, always at the same time of day, because we didn't want that to be a variable. We had two living rooms. They always had to come to the same living room didn't want that to be a variable. They always had to sit on the same side of the sofa, because there's a natural side, isn't there? Samples could not be delivered until they sat, because if I put their sample ID 2 there and ID 3 there, they'd sit next to their ID, and that might not be natural. So all of this detail had to be thought about. So they were given a bowl of snack, which was pre-weighed, and water, pre-weighed. They had their own, and they had five snacks to do over five weeks. So there was a whole week between. Because if you have five sweet snacks on five consecutive days, you are not eating as much of it on day five as you're eating on day one. Not because you like it any less, because your mind's gone to, I've indulged far too much already. So one week apart. 
they watched an episode of a show that they chose. Big Bang Theory, Miranda, Only Fools and Horses, Faulty Towers for the older types, and Friends. They had to always watch the same series. We couldn't <laughs> legislate for whether there was an episode that might encourage them to snack more or less. I wasn't going to sit through all of those episodes. Uh, but you can see the control that's going on there. Brilliant study. Best study ever. Um, they loved it. We revitalised marriages. <laughs> People came in pyjamas because we said, we want you to be just like you would be at home. There were throws, bookcases, plants, books, you know, book, stuff from my house. My house was stripped bare. Uh, it was all in these living rooms. It was great. And, uh, and they got to watch TV, eat snacks, and then answer some questions. And the questions were all about how do you feel? And we used a best-worst scaling method. So we gave them four emotional terms, and they had to choose which one was described best how they felt and which one least how they felt. What did we learn? We learned that <laughs> everybody felt amazing. <laughs> uh, there were five snacks, all sweet snacks, all commercial. All of them were well liked, but there were clear winners. So they did have discrimination between how much they liked the snacks. Interestingly, one of the snacks was pure chocolate. For all of the other snacks, they ate differing amounts, but when you cal calculated the calories, always the same calories. Very fascinating. They were very self-aware of how much they had eaten. For chocolate, they'd push straight through the barrier. They'd eat way beyond the calories of chocolate, <laughs> report that they did indeed feel sick, but very happy, <laughs> and, and would indeed be happy to eat more <laughs> of the chocolate, but not of the others. What we learnt was that by putting them in context, we created such a wonderful environment that they were always happy, <laughs> irrespective of whether they were eating a snack that they liked less, because it was a wonderful environment. So this message for me is that, yeah, you can do clever things with context. And it was still, we're still able to see the differences in, this, in the, how much they like the samples, which is important. But in reality, if we'd have done this in a booth and asked them how they felt, I bet that they would have felt different and how they felt would have been totally correlated with whether they liked the sample or not. In the natural environment, that took over. It overwhelmed anything to do with the products. They're all liked anyway. So important learning. If we really want to know about how a product makes us feel outside of normal life, we can't do it in context. That is my last slide. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And I apologize if we're a little bit over. Thank you.